so uh, our first orator is uh, the Professor Walid Habre, uh, coming from uh, Geneva, who will um, give us an overview of the perioperative adverse event in pediatric anesthesia. Thank you, Isabel, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so it's my privilege to share with you today the epidemiology of perioperative complications in pediatric anesthesia. As you will see, I will base uh, almost all my talk on the apricot study uh, that we accomplished in Europe in the last uh, uh, three years, uh, and where we were looking at uh, severe critical events during the perioperative period. And that comes my first slide. There's always a confusion between what we call a, a complication or perioperative complication. Are we talking about the consequence of a critical event or are we talking of uh, the severe critical event that may be life-threatening or may lead to a consequence? Considering the severe critical events, we may face three kinds of events. One would be the events that are predictable and preventable, and this is the big value of preoperative assessment to detect potential occurrence of laryngospasm and bronchospasm and get ready for that. The second option possibility is that you may face some predictable severe critical event if you are, for instance, dealing with a difficult surgery, but that can be unpreventable. And finally, you can face some unpredictable and unpreventable critical events. So here, I'm going to show you uh, some of the results that were somehow related to the severe critical events that were unpredictable and were not preventable. And somehow, we were recording throughout 265 centers in 33 European countries those events that required unplanned therapeutic administration to avoid the occurrence of a bad or severe outcome. And you can see on uh, this slide, uh, first the incidence of respiratory critical events with the laryngospasm, bronchospasm being the same. Um, you can see also here the incidence of cardiovascular instability. We had 10 cardiac arrests in nine patients, and uh, we had a uh, relatively high incidence of drug errors. The overall incidence of severe critical events throughout 265 uh, European centers was 5.3%. So you may say, and so what? So let's see whether we can compare this with what we know and what is, uh, what is present in the literature. Well, the only prospective study looking at observational study with recording uh, the severe adverse events uh, was uh, coming out from Wake Up Safe in the US. Uh, it's a project in th within the National Pediatric Anesthesia Safety Quality Improvement Program. And it's coming from 19 centers with 39 uh, anesthesiologists uh, locked in. And you can see also that the incidence of respiratory critical events was high, about 20% of the overall incidence, but somehow um, uh, lower than that observed in Europe, which is, was more than 50% of the overall severe critical events. And most importantly, we can see that in Europe, we had a higher incidence of severe adverse events. So can we compare with other numbers coming from the world? Well, uh, the only study that we have, which is a retrospective uh, study that we base our sample size calculation uh, uh, for apricot comes from Paris uh, back in 2002, where uh, the incidence was a bit higher, but somehow uh, comparable to that observed uh, now in Europe. Uh, otherwise, you can notice that the overall critical events is higher than that related or reported in the other publications in the literature. And uh, as you can see here, the respiratory critical events account for more than 50%. The incidence for cardiac arrest is about three in 10,000 um, case, and that led in uh, almost half of these patients to death at 30 days, but not uh, intraoperatively. Now, what about the outcomes? Uh, while um, most of the uh, uh, complications of severe critical events uh, for laryngospasm strider were uneventful, you can see that for uh, bronchospasm, 
and uh, bronchial aspiration in almost 50% of them, there were somehow severe outcomes with severe hypoxemia, prolonged intubation, admission to ICU, and also for the cardiovascular events, there was a relatively a, a high incidence of uh, severe um, uh, outcomes with even cardiac arrest or coagulopathy. Um, so that it has to be kept in mind. To, uh, uh, to, sum, uh, to finish with this uh, presentation, I would like to highlight here the risk factors for these severe adverse events that we are able to, uh, to identify regarding first respiratory critical events. And you can see here the multivariate uh, results of the multivariate analysis. And what does it mean, for instance, for age? That means for each year of age, you have 12% decrease in the risk of uh, severe critical events. And when you look at airway sensitivity, which is a composite of uh, symptoms like wheezing, upper respiratory infection, asthma, passive smoking, the risk is multiplied by two. So these risk factors here that I'm not going to num uh, enumerate them are, can be detected and therefore uh, put preventive measures preoperatively to avoid respiratory critical events. Similarly, you have here the risk factors for cardiovascular critical events uh, like prematurity, handicap, or children with ASA uh, physical status over three, uh, where there's a higher incidence of cardiovascular critical events, and that probably can lead to some procedures, specific procedures, to prevent the occurrence of complications. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walid, for this uh, very synthetic and very interesting presentation. So, um, basically, uh, could, you, could you tell us what we have uh, learned uh, from, uh, from, your, from the survey apricot study? Yeah, well, this is a, a very good question. Well, what we have learned uh, essentially, it's a large variability in our way of uh, uh, managing the children in Europe. Uh, it's a, a large variability in, in, in the uh, drugs we administered, in the airway management, in the ventilation management, and uh, probably that may have led to a higher incidence of uh, 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 critical events. But this needs to be uh, further uh, looked at, and we are currently doing secondary analys analysis, trying to uh, characterize whether there are some uh, uh, points where we can uh, uh, bring some improvement in our practice or at least establish homogeneous practice or uh, spread uh, throughout Europe good clinical practice guidelines. Okay, so um, I have another question and um, about the good clinical practice. Uh, have you an idea how to promote this uh, clinical good clinical practice and uh, evidence-based management? Well, we, we, an idea, it's difficult to say, there are many ideas, but one of the uh, uh, main difficulties is how to reach people. So one of the uh, ideas uh, is to detect from uh, the results of APRICOT where should we put priority and then target our education in congresses, uh, uh, to uh, to this to this specific um, uh, uh, complication or so. For instance, for laryngospasm in Europe, you have uh, so many non-evidence-based treatments that were applied when a laryngospasm occurred. So probably they are really uh, a place for improvement. And uh, we already establish a whole day of uh, out what we called it out of uh, uh, apricot uh, in June during the European Society of Anesthesiology meeting uh, where it is targeting on the uh, uh, adverse events and uh, to establish or at least to, um, uh, to, to, to present some good clinical practice uh, uh, for, uh, for to avoid the occurrence of these severe critical events. Okay, and um, during your presentation, you said that uh, there were large differences between countries, and uh, do you plan to, to give uh, them um, a feedback of that? Uh, I mean, an individualized um, feedback. Yeah, that's, uh, that was requested by many to specify the countries. I think it's not a good way to, to do. We are, unfortunately, um, we are not uh, yet ready yet for this culture of transparency, and it doesn't help to say this country is doing better than the others or doing bad than the others. 
Now, having said this, um, uh, where to put the uh, uh, cutoff? For instance, if you take a given country where they have 3% of our overall uh, critical events, is it the cutoff or is it better for those who are doing 2% or whatever, considering that it's probably not the same case load that was done in each country, in each center, etc. However, uh, one should point out that the UK uh, and Scotland together, uh, they actually totalize about, uh, about almost 40% uh, or 38% of the data. And uh, uh, I'm aware of some comparison that can be done with the rest uh, of Europe, and that could be a, a uh, somehow a step forward to see whether we can establish a cutoff or whatever that to consider in the future studies. So, um did you did you s do you think that there is um, a relationship between the number of anesthesiologists in a country and um, the incidence of uh, perioperative uh, adverse event? You mean the number of anesthesiologists yes. or practitioners or the level of knowledge <laughs> of a practitioner? <laughs> Both. Both. Uh, <laughs> you know, we fail to find out in the. Uh, uh, in the apricot, when we look at the multivariate analysis, we fail to find out a, an association between uh, the uh, level of uh, practice uh, and uh, the occurrence. However, we found, uh, when we considered only those centers who reported severe critical events, there was definitely uh, a trend towards uh, an association with a lower caseload and a higher uh, uh, incidence of severe critical events, which is in line with what is known or somehow published in other specialty. Um, uh, now, uh, considering one center, one country or whatever, it's difficult and it would be hazardous to make any association with the number present and the, uh, the severe critical events. Okay. So... Now, um, a question which is uh, a little bit basic, but how can we decrease the incidence of perioperative complication in pediatric anesthesia? I think as I started my talk with uh, uh, categorizing somehow the severe critical events, there are definitely some uh, that we can uh, predict and prevent. Uh, now, having a child who has a recent upper respiratory tract infection, who, who has a history of airway sensitivity, etc., there is strong evidence in the literature that these children, for instance, need to be uh, uh, characterized, need to have a specific premedication with a beta 2 agonist, uh, need to have a special uh, management, anesthesia management, like uh, probably uh, rather IV anesthesia rather than inhalation, etc. There are so many steps. I think uh, the Time is short here to 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 um, uh, to present all each of the uh, of these uh, uh, complications. But however, definitely we need um, all societies, uh, par particularly the French society, the European society, the European Society of Pediatric Anesthesia. They that we should uh, look and uh, somehow establish a really good clinical practice towards how to prepare these children, how who should anesthetize them, how to look after them, how to manage them, and how to follow them. Okay. So, the next step of the apricot study is? Well, the next step of apricot study is actually, as you may know, is nectarine that is now uh, in the phase of cleaning. And the next step is to keep up. We created with apricot a very nice research network throughout Europe, and we are looking for uh, uh, actually looking at further projects uh, taking from Africa, taking uh, some uh, uh, points that needs to be addressed uh, within Europe. So, uh, ah, we have a question uh, coming from the chat. Uh, so, what should be the minimum age for healthy children to be anesthetized by <laughs> a non-pediatric anesthesiologist? A good question, very okay, complicated. Okay, that's a good <laughs> question and difficult <laughs> question. I think I have a few seconds only. Okay. Coming from Apricot, I would say that less than three years of age you should be uh, somehow uh, some competencies in pediatric anesthesia. Now, this uh, question is coming from Chad. I think uh, some has to relate to the place, but uh, I, I think that would be the cutoff, and that's the cutoff that we have found in the apricot study. So thank you very much. I, sh I think we will maybe have some responses to this question in the following presentations.